Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of having a part among those who tell the story of Jesus in different parts of the world. We pray, O oh Lord, as we hear the pleading once again, as from the world outside Christ, telling us to tell them of the story of the Lord Jesus. We are praying that your deep love will be in every heart. So I will go out and tell nothing but the story of Jesus. And as the people here, they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we want to talk about pressing on towards the goal. In each of our groups today, the pastor's group, the language pastor's group, the women leaders group, the children church leaders group, our section for youth ministry, as well as our campus fellowship, the leaders and the workers. Together with the supportive ministry in the church, helping us to look into uh, the important part of the church dealing with finance, as well as the music ministry, that group, both for the youth and adults. We talked about the goals, the plans that we have ahead of us and in each of these sections from the pastors all through to the music group we have talked about what we believe the Lord will be leading us into during this year and it is one thing to have a plan or have a vision it's another thing for us to first of all know that that vision our plan is coming from the Lord. So we're not just having a plan of our own and asking the Lord to put his blessing and approval on what originated only from the fleshly desires of carnal, ambitious people. It's another thing to be able to know that we're getting this vision from the Lord this plan from the Lord and the plan he gives he also gives us the strength and the power to fulfill and we're going to look at what goals are how to realize those goals and how to depend upon the Lord as we endeavor to achieve the goals and to fulfill the responsibilities he says before us in Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 brethren I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have listened to the statement of a man who obviously was driven by the zeal of the Lord that consumed him. He was a person that confessed to King Agrippa in Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Before this man came to know the Lord, he had a goal. He had an ambition. He had a consuming passion. He had a kind of unconquerable desire that he will do something. He said, in the religion of my forefathers, 
in the religion of the Pharisees, he had something motivating him and driving him. And it was while he was in the midst of that kind of carnal, unrighteous, unscriptural desire and goal in life, in the very height of trying to fulfill what is set before himself, he discovered that his goal was not glorifying to God. In fact, it was doing havoc to the way and to the kingdom of God. The Lord arrested him and the Lord saved him. Not only that now that he gave him a personal goal to get to heaven, the Lord also gave him an enriching broad goal to take as many as possible with him to heaven. He had served the devil with great zeal. The Lord turned everything around that he will serve the Lord with a greater zeal. He knew no day nor night of resting while serving the devil. The Lord now changed everything, turned everything around that he will not have any holiday or any resting time. He must spend the rest of his life serving the almighty God much more than he served the devil. And he started immediately. You will see that from the moment the Lord called him, he got up, he got to Damascus, and he began to pray. Three days, three nights. Do you know that that prayer never left his life? Because in every epistle, he will be telling the people, I make mention of you in my prayers. I intercede for you. I am praying that the fullness of the will of God and the fullness of God himself will dwell in you efficient. Even the people he had never seen before, he will say, since I heard of your faith, I have never stopped praying for you. He started it immediately after conversion, he continued. And then we are told that after Ananas came to him, laid hands on him, his eyes were opened. We're told that in Damascus, he confounded the Jews, arguing with them, disputing with them, and proving that that Jesus is the Christ. What he started? At the point of conversion, the preaching of the gospel, he continued till the very last day here on earth. And he preached in almost every conceivable place. He preached in the cities. He preached by the seashore. He preached in the prison. He preached in the hired house where he was kept even when he was in prison. But then they gave him a little liberty. He preached before Festus and Felix and Agrippa. He preached even the word went into Caesar's household. What that man, the vision he received, from the very beginning, he carried on. And now you know how God used him. There are 27 books in the New Testament. And God used this man single-handedly to write 13 of those books in the New Testament. And the things he wrote, they contain the very mystery of the kingdom of God. When you read the epistle to the Romans, you will know that it's a classic by itself on justification by faith. When you read in the Corinthians, you will know that there is no other place in scripture. You find the gifts of the spirit explained very well for the understanding of the whole church. And when you read just the 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians, you will see the depth of knowledge on the resurrection of the dead. When you look at Ephesians, you will see the mystery that he reveals concerning the body of Christ. And when you read 1 Thessalonians, you will see that nobody talked about the rapture like Paul the apostle. You read all those epistles that he wrote, you know that he really did something for the Lord. And yet, beyond all that, 
after doing all that and preaching to almost every group of people in the then known world, he said, brethren, the heavenly vision that moves me, that drives me, the heavenly vision that takes sleep away from me, the heavenly vision that does not allow me to have any holiday, the heavenly vision that drives me and every day and every night, the heavenly vision that makes me to be on my knees up and upon my feet, the heavenly vision that makes me to speak and to write, the heavenly vision that makes me to carry the gospel to the far ends of the world, that heavenly vision is still driving me. I count not myself to have appeared it. I do not sit back and say, I've done so much. I have done enough. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are past. I've written that epistle. I've forgotten that it was done. I'm going to start a fresh walking for God now as if I never did anything for the Lord. I have prayed for those people and wonderful results have come out. I'm going to start my prayer life now as if I never prayed any prayer before. I've gone on the first missionary journey and I've come back and we have a lot of story to tell the Jerusalem church. But then I am going to continue now for the second missionary journey as if I didn't partake in the first. I've done quite a lot in the kingdom of God but every new day I'm going to start as if I did nothing before, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth. That's the spirit of a conqueror, reaching forth. That's the spirit of a person motivated by a goal, reaching forth. That's the attitude of a person that knows he has a call from the Lord, he has something to live for, reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark. He had a pressing spirit. Pressing on. Moving on. He had a kind of spirit that will not easily give up. Of course, you know, persecutions came. Of the Jews, I was beaten with stripes, 39 stripes, three times. I was beaten with the rod. I was stoned. I was left for dead. I was robbed. And then I was among peril among the false brethren. Perils among the Gentiles. Perils everywhere. In fact, the Lord is even telling me by the Spirit now that bonds and affliction await me in Jerusalem. But none of these things move me because I'm determined I will finish the course and the ministry he has appointed for me. That's a pressing man. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, he was a goal-oriented man. He was a highly motivated man. He was a person that had the ambition of the Spirit of God written in his heart, implanted in him like a seed, and then he went with it and he ran with it. That's why it's important if we are going to follow the footsteps of the people we find in the Bible that we should have a goal. And that goal should drive us. That goal should move us. That goal should dictate the pace of life, the way we walk and the way we move. Purposes and goals that clearly define a precise target. And describe plans of action are very important for our lives. With goals established, we need a clear direction along which we are to move. Our goals must be, number one, time-related. Number two, realistic. Number three, measurable. If we are going to have goals that will be meaningful, Goals that the Lord will say well done at the end of life and ministry. It must be time related. It must be realistic. It must be measurable. Goal setting is vital in accomplishing objectives. Without goals, you know what happens to us? We drift. And in fact, if we don't have goals, we dissipate our energy on trivial matters in life goals compel us to spend our time 
profitably and to use our resources wisely. That's why we set goals. We're setting those goals so that we will be able to spend our time in a profitable manner. We're setting those goals so that our resources will be used wisely for the expansion of the kingdom of God. And in our various groups, we have already discussed some goals before and beyond these goals we must capture something some arresting goals for our personal spiritual lives and our moral lives if all the goals we set is just for a bigger church building and also a greater congregation and also perhaps more effectiveness in ministry and preaching and service and there is no personal spiritual and moral goal for our personal lives you may find that you build a tower of babel but there is a confusion of languages and confusion of lives within your own family therefore make sure that before those goals we talked about this afternoon and beyond those goals we have already talked about let there be personal spiritual moral goals for yourself and also for the members of your family what's your dream for your wife what's your vision for your wife what's your desire for your husband What's your goal? What are you wanting to see accomplished in your husband? Not only by his effort, by your prayer, by your lifestyle, by your influence. Gentle, quiet, silent, yet effective influence on your husband. What are you wanting to see accomplished in his life? There must be a goal for the family. A goal for your wife, a goal for your husband. Do you have children? Are they very young? In fact, the younger they are, the better. Because you have a clean slate with every child. And you can write almost anything on that clean slate. If you leave your child and you do not set any goal for that child, motivated by the spirit of god inspired by the spirit of god led and directed by the spirit of god if you have a child or children and you have no goals for the children you allow their clean slate to be written upon by every hand in the world because if, if you don't set the goals there are agents and agencies there are people and parties there are men and women out there in the world that will write something on their slate and these children will take what those people write on their slate as their goal in life therefore you as the father you as the mother you are the one to set goals be led by God be led by the word of God be led by the deep desires that God has put in your heart and set goals for the family and for the children. And then you have set goals for yourself, personal life, personal development, spiritual life, moral life. You have set goals for your wife. You have set goals for your husband. You have set goals for the children. Now comes the great goal. In the service of the Lord that you say I'm not going to be like a bird that flies through the air and after the bird has flown through the air I look at the air I do not see any path that the bird made in the air it went through without making any mark you don't want to be in this life and just go through with nothing, nothing marked in the atmosphere of this world. Let them know that somebody lived at this particular time. And this is what he did 
for the glory of God. You know that you hear the names of some people. Why do you hear their names? Because they made a mark. You hear the names of some people in the Bible. But you hear the names of other people not in the Bible. For example, you hear Mary Slessor. We have to study about her when we study our history. She made a mark. Otherwise, she would not be in the book of records. We hear the name Martin Luther. We hear the name John Wesley. We hear the name C.H. Spurgeon. We hear the name Charles G. Finney. We hear the name D.L. Moody. And this one is still alive, Billy Graham. We hear names. We hear the name of Bill Bright. We are hearing names. And these names, why are we hearing them? Because they are not like the millions of people in the world who just live in this world. How many people are here in my own country? I don't hear their names and I hear the names of the people that are so far away. How many people are still alive today? I don't hear their names. I hear the name of John Wesley that died about 200 years ago. That's the difference. The people that have no goals, they wake up they eat they sleep they wake up they eat they sleep they wake up they eat again and they sleep and every day is wake eat sleep wake eat sleep and then after eating too much and sleeping too much eventually god said it's enough too much eating you are not doing anything come back home and they have gone and we didn't even know they were here no goal in life, nothing achieved, nothing done, you will do something. Yeah. And you will achieve something. Yeah. There will be a goal that God sets before you, that will drive you, that will move you, that will push you on. That even when you are dropping down tired like this, that thing within, it's like an engine. It's like a dynamite. It is moving you on the heavenly vision. And you'll be able to say, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Both men and women can have vision. You know, some uh, people in this world, when we... Sometimes you have never even seen them. You have never even met them. And yet when you hear that they have passed away from this place and they have gone to glory, you, you feel it. Although you never met them, but you feel it. Last year, 1995, the wife of T.L. Osborne passed home to glory. And I've never met her directly. I've seen her picture. And um, there are people that don't, uh, you know, like her because she's quite militant. And, you know, the husband is preaching and she is preaching. And I may not approve of everything, the way they do everything, because, you know, there are some of the ways uh, both of them used to minister. I may not approve of that way, because, you know, T.L. Osborne will be saying something and preaching and preaching. And in the same uh, case, Daisy Osborne, the wife, takes over and continues the preaching. That's their style. I think God loves them for their style. I may not enjoy the style, but God enjoys it. And so, you've never, I've never met her directly, but when I had last year she passed away, I felt it. Why? Because they had goals. And because they were doing something. And uh, the husband is still there, and now very old, uh, you know, and yet he is still doing something. Still doing something. And uh, last year, after the wife died, he said, at the age of, he, uh, he said the age, he started to preach and started to learn this and that. Then at this other age, I started to learn another language because he learned another language to preach the gospel. Then he said, at this age now, I'm learning to live and walk alone because my partner in service has gone home. You know, when you hear of such men, the people that are driven, the people that have goals and they are just moving on, they are getting old. They don't even realize they are getting old and they are still preaching and they are still moving on. I think those of us who are much, much younger, you will do something. 
How won't you do something in your life? Moses started at the age of 80. And he made a mark before he left. Think about it. 80 years had almost been totally wasted. And yet at the age of 80, he heard the call of the Lord. And then although he argued and felt what on an old stammerer do. At the age of 80, eventually with encouragement and rebuke, he rose up and see what he did at the age of 80. Some of us at the age of 40, 50, we cannot do a fraction of what that man did at the age of 80. Something will change. And we will rise up and do something important in this life for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, in Jesus' name. There are three points now. You, you already mark me with three points now, don't you? And you know that I'm just like Jude. He has all his three points every time. And you know, when you are like somebody in the Bible, you are in right company. So, I'm going to be like Jude and keep on being like Jude. I have my three points now. Number one, danger of unscriptural goals. Danger of unscriptural goals. Number two, determination to accomplish God-appointed goals. Determination to accomplish God-appointed goals. Number three, dependence upon God to reach his goals. Not your goal, not my goal, not deeper life goal, not my daddy's goal to reach his goals. Dependence upon God to reach his goals. Now, I need to touch on this point number one. Because if we don't touch on this point number one, we may rush ahead and move ahead into a kind of goal. And we may spend our lives trying to achieve that goal and eventually at the end of life, the Lord may tell us the goal we achieved wasn't his goal. That's why we're talking about point number one, the danger of unscriptural goals. In Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of China. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime at they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That was a goal. And it was a great goal. It was a kind of stupendous, magnificent goal. It was a goal that was bigger than every individual. It was a goal that demanded unity and effort and expense and knowledge and intelligence to be able to carry it out. And it was a goal that had in their mind a purpose that they did not want to be scattered all abroad. They wanted to build such a great city and such a great tower. In fact, they said it will be a tower that will make history whose top may reach unto heaven. And they said, let us make us a name. That is, when we do it, generations to come will talk about it and talk about us. And they will never forget us because in achieving, accomplishing this goal, we're going to make a name. Our name will not be written on sand that will be rubbed up by the feet of men. It will be written on the rock that geologists will study, that everybody will study. We're going to make a name. That was a goal, but it was not a scriptural goal 
because God wanted the people at that time to scatter and cover and replenish the whole earth. But they said they wanted something contrary to the plan of God, to the purpose of God, to the desire of God. They wanted to build a city and a tower that will reach unto heaven and they'll make them a name. Do you think they could not do it? Look at verse 6. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They were many, but they were so united, God counted them as a unit. The people is one. And they, ha they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You see, you can succeed. In a goal that is contrary to the purpose of God. Because you know, God has given us a measure of intelligence. A measure of strength. A measure of ability. A measure of the command of our local language. And even foreign language. And with a measure of the talent. And the ability. And the strength. And the intelligence and the capacity for thinking and working out things well the measure of all that God has given us we can achieve almost anything even things that are contrary to the very plan of God this one was contrary to the plan of God and yet God said if we leave them alone Father Son and the Holy Ghost if we leave them alone they will accomplish and they will have what they have imagined to do. That's the reason we ought to be careful. That before we rush ahead and say, I'm going to reach after and grab it and get it done, examine it. You see it according to the plan of God. It may look beautiful, may look magnificent, may look high, may look challenging, may demand all your intelligence and all your resources. It may appear that there are people in unity with you to be able to get it done, but is it of God? Is this the real plan of God? In verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city, unfinished project, unaccomplished, unsatisfactory life. The judgment of God stopped them. There are some goals that the judgment of God will have to stop. Therefore, examine those goals and find out, is this of God? In Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, reading from verse 12. In verse 12 it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, Here was the goal of Lucifer. Here was the goal of the morning star. He said, I will ascend into heaven. That's the goal. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That was the goal. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here is the climax of the goal. I will be like the most high. Now you can see certain goals. Certain goals is not limited to mortal men. You will see here Lucifer, the morning star. He said, why should I live a life that will just be a humdrum day to day and run of the meal, ordinary kind of life? There must be something magnificent, extraordinary, beyond, above what the Lord wills for me. And therefore he set the goals and he wrote them point by point. I will ascend into heaven because I have no goal less than the heights of heaven. They tell us the sky is the limit. But watch it, it's not always of God. And then said, I will exalt my throne above the angels, the stars, the servants of God. That may not always be the goal of God for you. 
And then says, I will siege also like a king upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That may not be the will of God. That was his goal. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. He wanted to create another God through himself. That was his goal. And this goal was great. Don't just say that the goal is great. There are other tests to know whether that great goal is of God or not of God. And that's why eventually he was thrown down, thrown away, brought down. Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And so we need to examine the goals that we have and find out if this is of God. First Chronicles chapter 17. First Chronicles chapter 17 from verse 1. Now it came to pass as David sat in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo! I dwell in an house of cedars, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. Here we find a redeemed soul, a saved soul, an anointed king, a man having the spirit of the Lord. For the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the spirit of Satan and evil spirit came unto Saul, and then David received the spirit of the Lord. And here was a man saved, redeemed, having the joy of salvation, and having a good intention. And the good intention is to build a place for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Who will say that it was wrong to build a place for the ark of the covenant of the Lord? Is this not a spiritual goal? Is this not a goal that tried to show the gratitude of David unto the Lord? I dwell in the house of cedars. See the provision of the Lord for me. Why shouldn't I do something for my God, the King of kings? And Nathan said, God is with you. You are not a backslider at this point. You are a real child of God. Go ahead. Go and do it. In verse 3. And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came unto Nathan saying, Go and tell David my servant. Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me an house to dwell in. What a great lesson. Not every good project is the will of God, the plan of God, the goal of God for me, for you. If you read other passages of scripture related to this story, God said, that thing will be done. But my goal for that thing being done is not you doing it, it's your son doing it. Another person will do it. You see, there are times we sit down and we think of it about every good thing under the sun in ministry, in preaching, in outreach. Every good thing that crosses our mind, that touches our brain, Anything that anybody can do, and we know this is not seen, and we know others have done it, and we know it can be done, and we know it will be to the glory of God, we write down everything. And as we write down everything, we see it is not sinful, we see it is even something that somebody must have to do. And then we present it to God and we say, Lord, this is my goal. And before the Lord says anything, we have run away, we have started the project. And God said, that's not my will. That's not the goal for you. You are not going to do that. I have another person that is going to do that. I think we ought, from that story, we ought to wait. We ought to think. And we ought to understand that it is not everything 
that we think should be done that we are personally to do. There is a danger of searching on scriptural goals. From all that I've read to you from the scriptures, you understand this, that success does not guarantee eternal reward. You may succeed in building that tower that reaches up to heaven. We men here on earth will praise you and call you an achiever, but you are not an overcomer. Achievers are not necessarily overcomers in God's sight. That you have such a great project, magnificent thing, and you have even done it, you have accomplished it. If that wasn't the goal of God for you, that doesn't mean that God will say, well done. Because um, if you have any goal, we want to find out what is the foundation, the basis of the goals. Number one, it may be motivated by selfish human ambition. That will not be of God. Number two, it may be motivated by carnal, worldly desires. That goal will not be of God. Number three, it may be because of satanic inspiration. You know that Satan himself had goals. But you will see from the pride in the planning, the self-exaltation in the planning, you will see that it was by satanic inspiration. It's like what also happened to Absalom. You see, God exalted on high. You see Satan wanting to take the place of God. Then you see on the human level now, you see David exalted on the throne. And you see Absalom wanting to take his place. That means then that kind of goal in the heart of Absalom was motivated by satanic inspiration. And even though you might achieve such a goal, you will even be judged for it. Number four, it may be because of proud, unsanctified nature in man that makes you to dream it up and to make you say, this is what I will achieve. Goals which do not match our calling. Goals which do not match our gifting, our unscriptural. There are things that only God can do. And there are things that men are privileged to do. When men set goals for themselves to do that, which only God can do, those goals are unscriptural and will lead to, will not lead to God's glory. Let us try to make some illustrations concerning goals which are not scriptural, concerning goals that God has not appointed for you or for me. For example, a deacon in the church. By deacon, I mean uh, those uh, people we have in First Timothy chapter 3, we have the place of a bishop, we have the place of a deacon. A deacon setting goals of apostolic ministry for himself. And he says, what I desire is to be an apostle. And the goal I can set, I don't want to set the goal of a house fellowship leader, the goal of an area leader, the goal of a zona leader. I don't want goal of coordinator. The goal I am setting is that of an apostle. But he gave some apostles. He didn't give all. He gave some apostles. And some, not all, prophets. And some evangelists. And some pastors. And some teachers. Don't set a goal that, uh, you know, is not matching your gifting and your calling. Or a wife, this is another goal. A wife setting goals to fulfill the role of a husband. You know, there are women that uh, they have this big, big dream. And they say, my husband has his call. I have my call. And the responsibility that God actually writes down for the husband as the overseer, as the pastor, as the leader, as the evangelist, as the one to really do the apostolic ministry and reach out, the wife will sit down 
and say, I read about Kathy Coleman. I heard about uh, Daisy Osborne. I heard about Woodward Ether. And I heard about these great women. And without inspiration from the Lord, without illumination from the Lord, without appointment and assignment from the Lord, she sits now and she begins to write goals and goals and goals. At the end of the writing, when you pick it up and you look at what she has written, they are the exact goals that God intends for the husband. And she abandons the husband. She will not take care of the husband. She abandons the children. She will not take care of the children and run with the goal. My sister, you may build that tower of Babel. And people here on earth may hear your name. But heaven may not know anything good about you. Heaven may just look at you as a proud, haughty, pompous, a person that has too much exaggeration about your ability and your desire. Find out. Is it the goal of God for my life? It is, you know, there are people that tell us anything you want, write it, you will achieve it. Uh -uh. David wanted something. He wanted to build and God said, no, you will not build. What does the Bible mean when it says he gave some, not all, as according to his will, he has set in the church. Those that will do this and do this and do that. Don't confuse issues. You know, sometimes there's an evangelist. This is another point. An evangelist setting goals to have the result of a teacher's ministry. A teacher is a teacher. An evangelist is an evangelist. And there are some few people God grants the great privilege of being evangelist and being a teacher. You look at Paul the Apostle. When he stands in the place of an apostle, you know this is an apostle. When he stands in the place of a prophet and he begins to tell us about the resurrection and about the order in resurrection and about the great mystery and about the fact that in the tricking of an eye, we shall all be changed. And he talks about the rapture and he talks about the things that are yet to come. He talks about the man of sin, about uh, the Antichrist. You know that this is a prophet. And then when he gets to the heathen field and he begins to minister as an evangelist, you know that this man has been an evangelist. And now when he puts his arms around the Thessalonians and he says that I care for you as a nurse will take care of his children. And we are not only wanting to impart knowledge on you, but to impart her very soul. You know that's a pastor. And then when he begins to teach teaching the word of god you will know that that apostle paul he was also a teacher but there are few people like that that god makes an apostle makes them prophet makes them evangelist makes them pastor makes them teacher they're very few and it is not me it is not you that will choose and say i gather everything together uh -uh. if paul gathered everything i will gather them well if you gather them like that and God does not support you, you'll crash. And you'll crush yourself. And you can destroy yourself. Therefore, let's make sure that the person that God is calling to be an evangelist is not searching the goal of wanting to have the results of a teacher's ministry. You know, there are novices, newcomers, new converts that search the goal to have the results of a bishop immediately. That won't work. Therefore, let us make sure that our goals are right. Our goals are reasonable. Our goals are given by God. Not only that, the method of achieving those goals must be godly and God-ordained. Also, the timing or the time period for achievement must be girded or guided and directed by God. If we have wrong methods, we may accomplish something like Jacob and Rebekah manipulated Isaac. And he tried to get the blessings of the birthright. Both of them suffered for it. Therefore, let's avoid the danger of unscriptural goals. Now we go to point number two. Determination to accomplish God 
appointed goals. That's all I want to do in my life. That's all you should want to do in your life. God appointed goals. God appointed goals. Not everybody will travel around the world like Chelos Bond. Not everybody will have crusades in all the countries, almost all the countries of the world, like Billy Graham. Not everybody will have a very large church of almost 800,000 people, like Yonggi Cho. Whatever God wants for an individual, let God set the goal. Let God give the assignment. Let God give the appointment. And then I will determine that what God wants me to accomplish, I want to accomplish it. Determination to accomplish God-appointed goals in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. This kind of message is different from the messages you are used to. The messages, uh, you know, that will just stir you up and say, we are well able, let's go at it. Well, we are well able. They, what they were saying is that God has appointed. You see the appointment of God that they are to go to the land of Canaan. God set the goal. He took them from Egypt for the purpose of taking them to the land of Canaan. And what they were saying is God has appointed it. God has set the goal. He says he's taking us to that land in particular. We are well able. We are well able is not in isolation. We are well able is not to carve out something for myself that God has not carved out. And then I say we are well able, let's go at it. You will destroy yourself. Therefore, let us find out what God has appointed. What God has ordained, what God has planned down that you ought to accomplish in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 51. Luke chapter 9 verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that it should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That was the plan of God for him. And he steadfastly set his face that he will do that, accomplish that goal that the Father had set for him. When an entrance appeared before him on the way, two of his disciples were uh, ready to deal with whoever stood in the way. Our Lord restrained them. What a lesson. That when God has set the goal before us, and we're setting our face like a flinch, wanting to go and achieve that thing that the Lord set for us, then some people may oppose. And there may be a John, a James, that says, we know this goal is of God. We know God wants you to accomplish this. And we know that these people that are opposed to the goal, we know they are not right. Let's call fire down on them. If you do that, even if you achieve the goal eventually, you will destroy your own soul. You see, it's not just get the goal done by all means. Get that achievement by all means. Accomplish that thing by all means. It is doing it with the method of God. In the way of God. That while you are achieving that goal, you remain holy. Because without holiness, even if you build your tower... Even if you build your tabernacle, even if you achieve the goal, even if you do whatever, if holiness is missing in the method, you will not see the Lord. That is the reason you will do like the Lord Jesus Christ and restrain your friends and restrain your supporters. Your supporters that are saying it must be done. We know it is of God. Anybody that's against it, we burn them up with fire. Be very careful, lest you yourself burn in the everlasting fire. We must be as determined as our Lord to accomplish the goal set before us. Yet, we must remain perfectly holy all the way through, lest we reach earthly goal and miss heavenly destination. Friends, are always ready to supply weapons of war, to fight the enemies against our goals. But we must always remember that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Shall we do evil that good may come? 
Shall we trample upon holiness that we may achieve our goals? Shall we forget holiness preaching in the church that church may grow? Shall we keep quiet on restitution so that we'll have added number to the church because we have set the goal that my church must reach 5,000 in this new year. And for my church to reach 5,000, if I talk about restitution, I'll be going against my goal. If I talk about one man, one wife, I'll be going against my goal. If I talk against worldliness, I'll be going against my goal of 5,000. Therefore, to achieve the goal of having 5,000 in my church this year, the real cardinal doctrines of the word of God, I push them aside so as to reach my goal. You may have a club of 5,000. But you will not have a congregation of 5,000 saved, sanctified saints. The people that are saved is what matters. It's not the number that the ushers are counting. Don't do evil that good may come. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Should we rescue multitudes from hell and finally perish in hell ourselves? Should we achieve all these goals we are talking about? Is it not the goals of saving other people? The goal of bringing them into the kingdom? The goal of building a church, not in our name, in the name of God and maybe deeper life? Is it not the goal of ministering and helping other people? Why should I be so foolish and set a goal and then drive at that goal to accomplish that goal and in the process of it, I save others, I lose my soul? What goal is that? Is it not your first goal that your soul must remain saved? And then on top of that personal goal that you remain saved, then you reach out to other people and get them saved? with goals that are agreeable to God. Let your goals be agreeable to God and derived from his word with pure motives. We need determination, diligence, and hard work to achieve success. Success does not come to the self-indulgent and the indisciplined. Real salvation and love for God will break bad habits. There are some bad habits that hinder us from achieving and from accomplishing the goal that God has for us. And those bad habits may be laziness, love of ease, and lukewarmness. Once you have determined, once you have decided that you know that this goal is of God and it is meant for your life, then there is the determination that goes at it, that gets through it, that will not be tired, that will be up and doing. In John chapter 9, verse 4. Here is the attitude, the disposition that helps you to be able to achieve the goal. John chapter 9 verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. I must work. Make sure it's the work of the Lord and then do it. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15. But when it pleased the Lord, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. That means I knew the will of God. I knew the goal is set before me. I received that heavenly vision and I knew that there is nothing of self there is nothing of the flesh. There is nothing of selfish ambition. This is all of God. And immediately I knew that this is all of God. I conferred not with flesh and blood. I went at it. I knew that this must be accomplished. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. He will not stand before mediocres. That means then, 
identify what that thing is the Lord wants you to do and then be diligent about it in carrying it out. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, from verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. You see, the gifts differ. Therefore, the goals differ. differ. Our callings differ. Therefore, the goals differ. What God intends and plans for each life will be different. Therefore, our goals will be different. You may be a pastor. Another brother may be a pastor in another part of the nation. You are different. Your talents are different. Your giftings are different. Even though both of you are called pastors, get the goal from God that is related to your calling and your gifting. So that it will not just be a goal that is, you know, all of self, all of the flesh, all of the mind of man. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy how? According to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Don't wait on another person's ministry. He that teaches on teaching. Those who are teaching, you know, sometimes uh, you find a, a young uh, believer is, you know, God has called him. And you will find that in his life, the teaching ministry is being developed. And then he attends a particular meeting and he sees another person that operates not the teaching ministry, but another kind of ministry that attracts attention. And then he desires that kind of ministry. He abandons the teaching ministry and then he runs after another ministry that the Lord actually has not planned for him. He that teaches on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with, faith, with cheerfulness. Therefore, let us make sure we do what he wants us to do. Verse 11, not slothful in business, in the business of the work of the Lord, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 17. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry, which ministry, which thou hast received in the Lord. Find out the ministry, the calling that you have received from the Lord. The goal that he himself has set before you. And then he says that thou fulfill it. With the grace of God, we will be able to fulfill the goal he sets before us in Jesus' name. Actually, you know, when it's the Lord setting the goal himself, and you are in the way of the Lord, and you're doing what he wants you to do, then you'll be able to achieve that goal in Jesus' name. Of course, from all these things I've said, there are some people that they are naturally lazy. Naturally, they don't like taxing themselves. And they will not pray to the Lord. They will just sit down and say, what can I do that I will not sweat too much? What can I do that I will not get tired? What can I do that I will still have leisure time for indoor games? What will I do that I will still have enough time to swim? There are some people like that. Those ones, they will set goals and those goals will amount to nothing. If you set it too low and God is not involved, it's not in the will of God. If you set it too high and God is not involved, God will not be glorified. That's why you will not set it for yourself too low or too high. You go to the Lord and you let him grant you that heavenly vision. And when he grants you that heavenly vision, it will be balanced up. It will be exactly what he wants you to do. Number three, dependence upon God to reach his goals. Not my goals, not the goals of the GS, not the goals of deeper life not the goals of so and so 
but to reach the goal set by God. That I know that this is the goal, I have the conviction within, that this is the goal he has set. But I need to clear it up. Don't go from here and say, yes, I agree with that. He has not set the goal for me to preach holiness. That's why I'm not preaching it. Uh-uh, you are going astray. He sets the goal for every preacher to preach holiness and righteousness. Am I right? So I don't want you to say, I understand now. God has not set goal for me to preach restitution. He has not set goal for me to preach baptism in the Holy Ghost. He has set the goal for you to preach the whole world, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you till the end, always till the end of the world. Dependence upon God to reach his goals, not my goals, not denominational goal, but his own goal. In Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, and in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now again, you have to balance this up with all the other parts of scripture. This means I can do all things your days for me to do. Because what's the use in doing what he has not ordained for you to do? It's not going to be of any profit. That is not going to be rewarded. The things he has appointed you for, to do, he has, he has ordained that you will do, I can do them. He has given me the grace and he has made the provision that whatever it is he wants me to accomplish, I can. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And therefore, as we depend upon the Lord, we know he is the Lord that strengthens us. He strengthens us. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. We need him. We need to depend upon him. We need to be trusting him. And it will be easy for us to trust him if we know that the goals are coming from him. If we know the goals are not selfish. If we know that the goals are not to elevate man, exalt man. If we know that the goals are not just ambitious, but it is to carry out the mind and the will of God. We'll be able to trust him and depend upon him. Without me, ye can do nothing. In verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. While we're carrying out the goals, you abide in the Lord, and let the word of the Lord be abiding in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. What ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, there are some people that have read, you know, this verse, and they said, well, the Lord said, I should ask what I want. Then they rush out of the building at noonday, and then they look up. They say, son, Joshua did it, I will do it. Stay right there for the next six hours until I come back to tell you to move. And the son keeps on moving without even paying attention to them. Why didn't the son stop? Because God has not called you to the same battle he called Joshua to. Because you do not need the son to stop to do what you need to do. Because now you have electricity and see, sometimes it can even be brighter than noonday when you turn on this kind of lights. You don't need that today. Therefore, you cannot just go out and say, I'm a child of God. Therefore, anything I just want, I just dream about it, I just think about it, I want the sun to stop there. You cannot do that. You have to get the vision from the Lord and the calling from the Lord and the goal is set for you by the Lord. If what you are commanding, if what you are asking is according to the purpose and the plan and the goal of God, the heavenly vision, then it will be done. In verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. Verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit shall remain. And that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
Now, as we bring uh, everything to a conclusion, let's now go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 13, reading from verse 30. The people had gone to the land of Canaan, and they had gone to check up, and they found that the land of Canaan was exactly the way the Lord had told them. A land flowing with milk and honey. And they brought part of the fruit back. And they knew what the Lord had said. He had given them the land. He wanted them to be there. But then some people said they saw difficulties there. They saw the giants there. And the giants were now about to keep them away from entering in. It was then Caleb said these unforgettable words. And here we are. We have talked about goals in the afternoon. From the things I've said tonight, reading from the word of God, you may have to modify those goals. Adjust those goals. Pray on those goals. Stre spread those goals before the Almighty. And say, Lord, in the afternoon, this is what I wrote. When I heard in the discussion, in the planning. But Lord, what will you have me to do? I wrote in the afternoon that this year my church will reach 2,000. I didn't even ask you, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord may say, the 400 that are there are not even all saved. The 400 that are there, many of them are backsliding. The 400 that are there in the church, they are immature. The 400 members you have at present, they don't know their left from their rights. The 400 members that are there at present, they are not sound in the teaching of the word of God. Instead of adding immaturity to immaturity, carnality to carnality, concentrate on these 400 people. When you have done solid work with them, I'll tell you the next step to take. Maybe that's what the Lord will say. Instead of running ahead and rushing ahead and saying, I want 500 500 goats, 5,000 goats, rebellious, stubborn people, or do you want the people that are saved? The people that are standing on the word of God. You will go back to God. You will say, God, this is what I wrote down. We didn't even pray. And I didn't allow you to minister to have illumination inspiration within me before I wrote them. I just had everything. I said, yes, I will do this. Yes, I will do this. But now, show me the land of promise. Show me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to accomplish. And then when the Lord has shown you, you end up with the words of Caleb. In chapter 13, Numbers, verse 13. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and he said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Are we able? Are we able? Let's rise up and tell the Lord, in his strength, in his power, in his ability, we are able, that is, able to do what he wants us to do, not what he wants another person to do able to mature the saints able to make the saints of god to be firm to be consecrated to be holy able to establish the church of god in sound doctrine not just crowd not just number not adding a uh, carnality to to immaturity not just adding uh, novices to novices but able to make the word of work of God solid. Make it solid. In the women's section. Not just getting more women in that do not know left from right. But women that will stand on the word of God. <laughs> Developing workers. Not multiplying the number of workers. The present workers are wishy-washy. But to make those workers sound and stable and steadfast. And they will be people that know they are led from their right. Not just adding to the number, but maturing them. What you see the Lord wants me to do? What will thou have me to do? In the financial area, 
we are not setting goals of getting millions, millions of naira. Maybe we don't need the millions. Maybe we need less money and muscles. Maybe we need less calculation and uh, more consecration. Take the goals to the Lord. Take the goals to the Lord. Not what I want, not my will, but I will be done. Not goals motivated by pride, by selfish ambition, by carnal imagination, but goals coming from God. He wants his church strong. Let the goal be according to his will, not number, spirituality, maturity, faithfulness, consecration, Bible-based conduct and behavior, holiness. Let the goals be praiseworthy. Let the goals be worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Goals that deal with number, 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 numbers alone will not glorify God. We have too much number already. Too many mature people already. Too many wishy washy converts already. We have made enough noise already. Let it be goal of power and fire. The goal of spirituality and maturity. The goal of making the believer sound in the faith. Not goals of image building. We have no image to build. We're not competing with any other church or any other individual. Their church is this big.